Ladies and gentlemen, Charles F. Hummel. I want to thank Richard and Claire and his assistant Claire and the trustees of the East Hampton Historical Society for being so helpful and so willing and so ready and so quickly making a decision to uh, go ahead with this fun fundraising event. So many years ago, one of my professors at the University of Delaware, John Monroe, who, <coughs> whose field was local history, said that we will never, never have a complete history of the United States of America until we have more and more complete local histories. And it's the East Hampton Historical Society that is a moving force, not only in the village, but in the township in Suffolk County in preserving and advertising and keeping alive local history. I mean, you have to look at this group this morning and say, who said history is dead? A glorious. <laughs> Uh, Saturday in mid-May, and the room is filled with people who, who are clearly interested uh, in history. So this morning we're going to look at some of the background material relating to the Dominique Craftsman, and then this afternoon have an in-depth look at uh, some of the new discoveries in, in the furniture that they produce in their shops just down the street from here on North Main Street. For more than 100 years, craftsmen represented by four generations of the Domini family were able to support themselves and their families with the products of their craft activity. Few records and no products documented to Nathaniel Domini III, who was born in 1714 and died in 1778, apparently a carpenter and surveyor, and according to family histories, a clockmaker None of that has survived. My studies, therefore, have focused on a father, son, and grandson, active between 1760 and about 1850. They were Nathaniel Dominey IV. He's born in 1737, dies in 1812. Nathaniel V, born in 1770 and lives a long life, and dies at the age of 82 in, 17, in 1852. And then Felix Domini, his son, born in 1800 and who dies in 1868. In the past and in the current centuries, many individuals are called to become craftsmen. Many actually practice a craft, but very few are able to earn a living as craftsmen. Why then were the Domini craftsmen able to successfully function as craftsmen throughout half of the 18th century and for almost half of the 19th century? The answers to that question can be found in the unique survival of their more than 2,000 craft tools and shop equipment, more than 200 family manuscript items, and the survival of hundreds of objects made in their shops. I know that uh, it, obviously in East Hampton, in the village, and in, in the township, uh, you like to call the dominies your own, and they are. But actually, the survival of all of that material into the 20th century, and now preserved, we hope, <laughs> into future centuries, is important and unique because there are no other comparable survivals of the work, complete range of work and products and equipment and technology of colonial American and early 19th century craftsmen. <laughs> Moreover, they have a global influence. A few years ago, I was invited by the uh, Regional Furniture Society of Great Britain to give uh, a lecture on the Dominies in England. And I said, when I got the telephone call, well, why do you want me to do that? That's like carrying coals to Newcastle. You've got plenty of that material uh, in the British Isles. And they said, actually, no. We don't have any survival of material that's comparable to the Domini survival. So I think you can see it has a local, national, and a global impact in terms of, of history. And 
what craftsmen did and what they were able to achieve at a time when everything, everything that you had to own and use was made by hand. Furniture that they produce, as I indicated, will be discussed this afternoon. But this morning, I want to explore the social, economic, and cultural factors that help to explain why the dominies prospered and that shaped their shop production. What you're looking at, obviously, is a photograph of the Dominie House as it looked in 1940 when Daniel Hopping sent a team out from New York City uh, of the Historic American Building Survey to photograph the shops of the house and to make measured drawings of them. And then on the right, a floor plan uh, of the house and shops, their measured drawings. And that material now survives in the Library of Congress as part of the Historic American Building Survey uh, material. Being in the right place at the right time has always been a partial explanation for success stories. In the Dominey's case, that phrase is quite applicable. By the time that Nathaniel Dominey IV began to work as a craftsman, his family had lived in East Hampton for almost 100 years. The first Nathaniel Dominey settled in East Hampton about 1669, as you heard in the mayor's proclamation, only 21 years after the town was founded. The home in which Nathaniel IV lived had been built by his family about 1715, 45 years before he became active as a craftsman. The woodworking shop in which Nathaniel IV and V and Felix Dominey worked is visible attached to the right <coughs> rear side of the house. It was probably built about 1750 by Nathaniel III. Clockwork and watch repair were practiced by Nathaniel IV for over 30 years on the entrance floor of the Dominey house. <coughs> Later, starting in about 1797 and 1798, Nathaniel IV and Felix did clock and watch work in a separate shop attached to the left-hand side of the house uh, in, in this slide. Father and grandson made about 90 clocks and had repaired over 1,100 watches owned by almost 2,000 owners between the mid-1760s and about 1840. Social and economic historians have no clue about the number of people who owned watches. They always consider watches to have been as expensive as tall case clocks. And they could be. If you were a prosperous merchant uh, and you had your portrait painted by Ralph Earl uh, showing you proudly uh, exhibiting your gold watch <laughs> with the linking gold watch fob chain, that cost $100, that's, that's why they thought they were incredibly expensive. What they don't understand is that there was a huge market in secondary and used watches. And you could buy a pocket watch in that period for uh, as little as $5, sometimes as little as, as $3. So just think about the fact that they were servicing over 2,000 people who owned these 1,100 watches in that uh, period of time. The Dominey's house and shops were located, of course, on North Main Street, the road that led from the town to Three Mile Harbor, Gardner's Bay, and Long Island Sound. That location also provided a good land connection to the other villages and towns that comprised East Hampton Township. What you see now on the screen is a modern map of Long Island and an inset of East Hampton here on the right, the Dominey shops out here on North Main Street. I think it's significant that when Winterthur began to acquire the Dominey Tool Collection in 1957, there were published references only to Nathaniel Dominey IV. All of those references considered him solely as a clockmaker. Indeed, the only photograph that appeared in the East Hampton Star in 1946, when the house was torn down and the shops were uh, re removed, the contents emptied out, and the skeleton of the shops 
uh, was removed to a beachfront location here in East Hampton. The only photograph that appeared in the East Hampton Star at that time was the removal of Nathaniel IV's workshop, clock shop, based on surviving clocks and his somewhat morbid but realistic watch paper with its motto, we must all die. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> he was considered to be, and the family were considered to be, only clockmakers. The survival of Felix Domini's watch, make, uh, watch paper proclaiming him a clock and watchmaker in East Hampton, together with the existence of enough Domini tools and equipment to build a clock or repair watches. We could, if we could put in a forge, an active forge at Winterthur, we could build, um, build Domini clocks. That survival of their equipment is that complete. And they serve to reinforce their reputation as clockmakers. But Felix too did occasional woodwork, although he did not make furniture. Moreover, in 1957, the same year that Winterthur began to acquire the Domini tool collection, Ethel Hall Burko published The Cabinet Makers of America. No member of the Domini family was listed. But when I returned to Winterthur from service in the Army in 1958, following a two-year stint, I was confronted with a huge chaotic mound of tools and equipment that even in my ignorance looks suspiciously like woodworking implements. Here you see those tools and equipment in Winterthur's galleries building as reinstalled in 1992. In addition to East Hampton Village and Township, the Dominic craftsmen provided services to individuals living in Flushing, Huntington, Islip, Mauritius, Patchogue, Quogue, Riverhead, Southampton, Smithtown, Southhold, and that sounds like an old Jack Benny story, <laughs> Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga, but um, <laughs> those are only the communities they, that he happened to list in the accounts, and quite probably there were many, many more communities than the ones that he took the time to, to list. A short sail across Gardner's Bay and Long Island Sound were customers in Haddam, Hartford, Lyme, Moodus, New Haven, Saybrook, Stonington, and Wethersfield, Connecticut. On the right, Thomas Jeffrey's map of New England shows how close Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts were to, uh, to Long Island and to East Hampton. The prevailing west to east winds made for a quick passage to those shores and a slower sail to New York City in the 17th, 18th, and very early 19th centuries. This afternoon, I'll touch on the relationship of furniture forms and decorative motifs between areas bordering Long Island Sound. The other fascinating aspect of the survival of the Domini equipment and its history on your left, you see a view taken in 1887 of the famous Newport, Rhode Island cabinet maker, Christopher Townsend, his house. And here is his shop, which was attached to the house, just as the Dominie's was. And it's almost exactly the same square footage as the Domini woodworking shop was. And on the right, there's a group slide of material from the Dominic Tool Collection and showing up the top a nocturnal. And I'll talk about well, why that is important. Both Dean Faley and Luke Beckerdite in their studies have shown that the Townsend family of cabinet makers in Newport, Rhode Island stem from a family of joiners and woodworkers centered in Oyster Bay, Long Island. The view on your left is, as I said, a photograph taken in 1887. And um, it, it is important because, again, it gives an illustration that so much wonderful material was produced in areas and shops that today we would call a mom and pop shop. 
um, never manned by more than a couple of people, two or three people uh, at a time. In 1762, Nathaniel Dominey IV purchased his copy of Nathaniel Coulson's The Mariner's New Calendar from a Mr. Bird in Newport. His name is in the, inside the book and he says in that um, in inscription that he bought it in Newport from Mr. Bird. Uh, it, and it was a diagram, an illustration in the Mariner's New Calendar from which Nathaniel Dominey IV copied and made his nocturnal. Nocturnal was a very important instrument, and I've got a slide of it we'll, we'll uh, show in just, just a moment. It wasn't until 1798 that John Lyon Gardner, proprietor of Gardner's Island, noted that New York City surpassed Boston and New England as the chief market of eastern Long Island. Eastern Long Islanders looked to Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut rather than New York City until quite late in the 18th century. Here is a, a detailed slide of the nocturnal that was copied from Nathaniel Colson's book of 1762 by Nathaniel Dominey IV. The reason the nocturnal is important is that it was the instrument that clockmakers and people who repaired watches used to check the accuracy of the timepiece. Uh, you used it at night to sight on the uh, Great Bear and Little Bear constellations because it was known, already known at that time, that those uh, stars were a constant. And you could, using their location, uh, and a lot of calculation <laughs> on the nocturnal, uh, moving the levers around, come to the exact time it should be when you were watching or looking at uh, the great bear or little bear. So it was a very important instrument, and not only for the dominies, but practically everyone who sailed ships at that time uh, had to have and did use a nocturnal. New York City had not been devastated by the American Revolution. And here you're looking at two views of the Tontine Coffee House of about 1797, painted by Francis Guy. It was because of the long occupancy of British troops there following the early years of the American Revolution that the city was pretty much left intact. And so in, in 1797, Francis Guy captured the hustle and bustle in the city around a popular meeting place for businessmen and merchants called the Tontine Coffee House. A sloop owned by the Isaacs family made regular weekly runs to New York City from Three Mile Harbor. The Dominies referred customers to shops and iron furnaces in that city, and Felix Dominie was sent there to apprentice to a clock and watchmaker. And in fact, Nathaniel Dominey IV's watch paper and Felix Dominey's watch paper came from engravings on copper plates made by Samuel Maverick. I've heard rumors that Samuel Maverick was related to the Dominey's, but I frankly have not been able to, to pin that down. Note that a guy records in his painting a venue house on the corner and he's, <laughs> he's selling a high chest of drawers and he's selling a chair table and used furniture. Again, the, the sale and retention of uh, used material was very important to um, consumers in the 18th century and in the early 19th century. The importance of waterway connections in moving goods and ideas is emphasized in this 1765 watercolor view of a Flushing Long Island farm depicted by Major Thomas Davies, a British Army engineer, tied up at a small dock. You can just see the mast of a, of a sloop. That was like so many sloops used to carry surplus farm products for sale in towns and cities in exchange for goods needed on the farms. It's not surprising that in 1799, making use of local Gardner family connections, Nathaniel IV made a clock for David Gardner 
and shipped it by boat to his home in Flushing. The Dominique craftsmen were also fortunate to have been born in a rural agricultural area. What you're looking at now on the screen uh, will be a series of paintings by uh, William Sidney Mount, one on the left, Farmer's Nooning, painted in 1836, and on the right, painted in 1848, uh, a farmer wetting his scythe. Like most craftsmen producing goods in colonial America, they resided in agricultural areas, also in the early years of the New Republic. The vast majority of people lived and worked in rural areas. The United States Census of 1790 counted a rural population of over 3,700,000 individuals, while only 202,000 people lived in urban communities. Now, museums preserve all the city material, but almost everything, the majority of almost everything was being made and used in agricultural rural areas in colonial America and in the early years of the New Republic. In all 13 states in the 1790 census, there were only 24 towns and cities that had more than 2,500 people. They were tiny tiny communities. East Hampton Township had only 1,250 inhabitants in 1776 and had grown to only 2,076 inhabitants by the 1840 census, so there was very, very slow growth. These figures emphasize why the Dominies' long existence in East Hampton and their proximity to other markets were so important. Dominie males and females, I don't have to tell you this, those of you who live here know it. Dominie males and females had married into local families for six generations, thus creating a network for customers not only in East Hampton Township but in other Long Island communities as well. Their surviving account books list well over 1,600 names of different customers, and I'm not talking about the watch register now just uh, the non-watch register accounts. The register of watches repaired between 1762 and 1827 records, as I said, in excess of 2,000 customers. In describing the state of American manufacturers in 1794, Tench Cox defined rural tradesmen and manufacturers as those who live in the country generally reside on small lots and farms of one acre to 20, and not a few upon farms of 20 to 150 acres, which they cultivate at leisure times with their own hands, their wives, children, servants, apprentices, and sometimes by hired laborers, or by letting out fields for a part of the produce to some neighbor who has time or farmhands not fully employed. On your left is uh, William Sidney Mount's painting of cider making of 1841, and on the right, a still life uh, view in 1856 by the same artist called Currents. At the start of his career, Nathaniel IV had performed agricultural labor for others, such as cradling, bundling, and storing oats. By 1770, he was crediting customers for carting wheat, flax, corn, and rye from his family's acreage. His son Nathaniel V, at the age of 20, brought income to the household by cradling an acre of rye and other agricultural labor. The assessment roll of East Hampton Township records that in 1814, the Dominies owned 100 acres of land. As late as 1830, Felix Domini purchased 12 sheep at 46 cents a head to graze on their land, and he also obtained sweet potato seed for his garden. In 1794, Nathaniel V and a helper, Lewis, spent six days building a cider mill, very much like the one you see in Mount's painting. They built that cider mill for L. Nathan Parsons. The Dominique craftsmen, primarily both Nathaniels, 
made and repaired large numbers of farm tools, such as rakes, harrows, plows, cow and oxen yokes, sides, and hatchels. Rural craftsmen were in a better position economically than their city counterparts. Food and cloth were either self-supported or obtained through barter. Apples, a diet staple, provided dried fruit for soft and hard cider and vinegar. Currants, cherries, quince, and peaches were put up in jams or pies. In 1810, for example, one of Nathaniel Forth's customers paid him with three barrels of cider. Earlier in 1790, he credited one of his accounts for supplying 22 pounds of dried apples and seven gallons of vinegar. Felix Domini recorded in his weather diary cherrying at Gardner's Island in July and an island voyage, girls and boys, peaches ripe in September 1822. I could make a snide comment, I guess, and say, I hope when he said peaches ripe, he was referring to fruit, not a young lady. <laughs> William Sidney Mount's famous painting of eel spearing at Setauket, painted in 1845. And on the right, you see some actual eel spear poles and spears owned uh, locally. Nathaniel Dominey IV and V made many eel spear poles and fish hooks for local customers and for their own use. In one year, 1810, they credited customers for supplying 21 pounds of eels and 36 pounds of fish. I wish Mount had, had uh, done a painting of Fisher Boys. This, is, uh, this one is sneaked in. This is actually a, a watercolor drawing by Lewis Fisher, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, amateur historian and artist, painted in 1818, but it shows Fisher boys and seines, and an activity that obviously was very, very common uh, in this area. Felix Domini notes that he went fishing for cod at Montauk and caught an unnamed species off Gardner's Island, probably totog or blackfish. And he also caught, he says, 26 fish at Three Mile Harbor. The marshes, waterways, and topography of eastern Long Island also provided the Dominies with abundant wild game such as geese and ducks. And on your left is Mount's painting of Crane Neck across the marsh painted in 1851. And on the right painted in 1837 is painting Raffling for the Goose. And those marshes also provided of course a lot of the reeds that were used, rushes that were used for chair seats for Dominique furniture. About 1819, one of Felix Dominique's friends penned a note to him asking, please to give me a detail of your tramp on Montauk. Did you get that Thanksgiving goose? I guess you had your labor for your pains, hard work for little gains. The same friend later that year inquired, I want to know if you heard any firing last evening. The boys built a fire with shavings in the street. And in a few minutes, the fowl began to come. Ducks of every description, brant and wild geese. It was fine sport, I assure you. Henry Smith Mount, the older brother of William Sidney, in 1831, captured the importance of beef, game, and fish in the activity and diet of Eastern Long Islanders in these two paintings. The Dominies often had a surplus of all three foodstuffs and sold them for cash or in exchange for items they needed for craft or household activities. On the left, a painting called Winding Up by William Sidney Mount, painted in 1836, and on your right, wonderful, wonderful whalebone and mahogany swift that was made by Nathaniel Dominey uh, for his wife about 1800. The Dominies were never in want for woolen or linen yarn, woven cloth or clothing. They grazed their own sheep to supply mutton and wool and raised flax 
for linen. Their customers also paid the craftsmen with quantities of wool and flax, as well as woven blankets, coverlets, plain and check linen sheets, and tailored clothing. This swift used to wind wool yarn into skeins and skeins into balls of yarn was made by Nathaniel Fifth for his wife. He obviously didn't have time to sit and hold the thing. So, you know, he made something that would be quick for his wife to use by herself while he was busy working, making other products. Not only an abundance of fish, but also of whales could be found in offshore waters near East Hampton, thus providing an ample supply of whalebone for use by the Dominies. The swift reveals Nathaniel V's familiarity with neoclassical design motifs almost better than uh, om any other dominie made object that has survived up until the time that um, the Sherlock Holmes of <laughs> Glenn Purcell and Charles Keller started uh, finding and, and locating uh, pieces of furniture made in the new federal neo neoclassical style and empire period styles. Before that, I, their, their work is so important because before that, we knew that they made objects into those <coughs> periods, but we had no idea what they looked like. They were just entries in, in accounts and had never been brought to anyone's attention uh, before that. Among the younger dan Domini generation, dancing was a pleasant and popular form of recreation. Mount's 1830 painting on the left of rustic dance after the sleigh ride, and on the right his 1845 painting of Dance of the Haymakers, I think indicates the fact that lots of Eastern Long Island, younger Eastern Long Islands, were fond of dancing. In 1828, Major Felix Dominey received a letter from an acquaintance in Sag Harbor describing plans for a 12th night celebration. They hoped for 70 subscribers to witness militia setting off black powder, partake in a dinner limited to a cost of 75 cents, and a ball in the evening has been mentioned. Felix Domini certainly approved of a ball to conclude that evening. In the 1830s, Felix paid tuition in the art of dancing and listed the dances he had learned plus the instructions for performing them. The dances included the New Century Hornpipe, Miss Bruce's Reel, Morning Star, Morgiana, Chantreuse, Collie's Hornpipe, The Washington Reel, Molly Hang the Kettle On, <laughs> The Rang's Hornpipe, and the current sensation, The Paddywhack. <laughs> You know, it's really unfortunate that a belief persists to the present day that individuals who possess a high degree of craft and mechanical skill are all brawn and no brain. In part, that belief stems from the Renaissance, when the idea took root that fine artists were creative and were superior thinkers, and because of that, should be distinguished from craftsmen. Thus was created an exalted status for one and a lower place for the other. The Oxford English Dictionary notes that in 1549, the word mechanic meant, quote, pertaining to or involving manual labor and skill, unquote. 50 years later, by 1599, it states that mechanic also meant, quote, belonging to or characteristic of the lower orders, vulgar, low, base, unquote. Historians tend to forget that as a group, craftsmen in the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries were among the most literate segments of society. They were better at reading and writing than the vast majority of their fellow citizens, except for obviously clergymen, lawyers, doctors, but that group was small compared to the number of craftsmen who were at work and who were literate. 
it's axiomatic that a clockmaker be conversant with mathematical principles and able to read directions in handbooks or in letters from his customers. Nathaniel IV owned and read, obviously, Nathaniel Coulson's The Mariner's New Calendar that was revived and published in London in 1761. In turn, Nathaniel V and Felix owned and read Coulson's book. Nathaniel IV also owned and read John Milton's Paradise Lost, and I wish that the copy of that uh, volume, his volume, had survived. What you're seeing uh, on your left is a copy of Milton's works in the Houghton Library at Yale. He also owned and read Benjamin Franklin's autobiography and lectures by Soam Jennings, probably disquisitions on several subjects, which he sent for from New York City in 1793. Letters from the Dominies are succinctly expressed, and their words are spelled in more than a simple phonetic fashion. They kept day books, account books, and weather books or diaries. Receipts survive to reveal that Nathaniel IV and Felix Dominie subscribed to newspapers published in Sag Harbor. There are many receipts and references to the education of Felix Dominie and other Domini children. This is extraordinary, and we have to thank Joy Lewis for preserving these volumes, all of which were owned by members of the Domini family and read by them. Think about this. On your left is a 1797 edition of Le Liaison Dangerous, which Clara Domini read in French. In French. Incredible, I think. Um, how her family let her read that. <laughs> that thought um, was another question, but at any rate, um, she did. And her, sig her signature is, is in the book on, on, the, on a flyleaf. And on the right is, as I said, a shelf of books owned by the Dominique craftsmen and children. Incidentally, many of these, if not all of them, are in the exhibition upstairs in, in a case. And you can see them, and Charles Keller has carefully opened some of them so that you can see the Domini family inscriptions inside the covers of, of those books. Surviving books um, suggest that their education was much more extensive than that of Nathaniel IV and V. When he was 19 years old, Felix received a letter from a friend stating, when you get your language completed, you better advertise for a school, and I should like to come. In 1826, as I said, she, Clara Domini not only was reading Le Liaison Langerous, but maybe as punishment, a history of the life of Saint Evangeline. <laughs> Another key, I think, to the Domini's success in supporting themselves in, in, as craftsmen is the fact that there were always a substantial number of years during which father, son, and grandson could work together. You see uh, Mount's painting of 1850 on your left called An Axe to Grind, in which the father is obviously about to instruct his son how to put a, a sharp edge on an axe. And you see what was the case in many households where families uh, were in business and trained at least one of their uh, sons to carry on that business. At the top, these are Nathaniel the fifth accounts, and here you see he's making an entry from Daddy's book. And that entry made at a time when he was quite mature and had his own family, but he's still living in his father's house. His father is the head of the household, and not, it's not until really after his death that Nathaniel the fifth comes into his own. And I, I just want to digress for a moment, and quite honestly, I think that one of the things that contributed to um, the fact that Nathaniel Dominey VII was not able to make a success 
as a craftsman or in any endeavor that he took on. I think it quite honestly the fact that when he was eight years old, in effect, his father abandoned him. Uh, Nathaniel VII is born in 1827. Felix Domini leaves East Hampton in 1835, eight years when his son is eight years old. At that time, Nathaniel VII's grandfather is 65 years old. And it seems to me that it, he just doesn't get the same kind of training and attention, apprenticeship, that the earlier generations of the Domini family were able to, to receive. But the fact that there were always a substantial number of years for father, son, and grandson, Nathaniel IV, V, and Felix, uh, in which they could work together, that enabled them to specialize in their craft activity and increase their production. Nathaniel Dominey received sufficient training to begin working on his own by 1758. His father didn't die until 1778, 20 years later. That enabled Nathaniel IV to concentrate on making clocks and repairing watches and clocks, as well as other metal work, while his father, Nathaniel III, focused on woodwork. And then in turn, when um, Nathaniel V started his craft activity about 1789, his father was able to again concentrate on metalwork, clockwork, and repairing of watches and clocks until his death in 1812 because Nathaniel V takes on all of the woodworking activity. On the screen you see bullet and shot molds made by Nathaniel Dominey IV in 1779. He supplied local, local militia uh, with these bullets and, and bullet and shot molds. And because um, that was obviously dangerous when the British Army under Tarleton made raids out in this area. For a while, the Domini family had to skitter across the Sound and, and take shelter in Connecticut before returning. But Nathaniel Domini IV and I think the fifth, they did have a great sense of humor because when he, uh, when he returned, the notorious Bannister Tarleton sent his watch to um, Nathaniel IV to be repaired. And in his accounts, Nathaniel IV lists Tarleton under the heading of transient persons. <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> and then he, he, his knee slapper that's in, uh, one, of, uh, in one of Nathaniel V's um, letters about a joke, he says, why is an old man like a nail in the ceiling? Drove in the ceiling. Because they are both infirm. <laughs> <laughs> the downside, of course, of this relationship was in the fact that despite the being 39 years old in 1809, Nathaniel V was not yet head of a household. And you saw in that previous slide that he had to credit Thomas Baker with 13 shillings for watch repair from Daddy's book. A pole lathe was very useful in a small shop because it did not require an apprentice's assistance. As we'll see this afternoon, Lathes were very important to the Dominies for their furniture uh, production. On your uh, left, you see the oak uh, pole lathe that probably Nathaniel Dominey III had, uh, had made and put together about 1750. And on the right, a plate from a London encyclopedia of 1754. John Barrow's New and Universal Dictionary of Arts and Sciences showing a pole lathe that is very similar, if not identical, to the uh, pole lathe that was in the Domini shop. That, that is another indication of why the Dominis are so important, because they didn't own Barrow's encyclopedia, but 
it, many of the pieces of equipment and tools that survive in the Domini shops, you can find their exact counterpart in French and English encyclopedias of the time. And that provides proof that the knowledge about process and technique and certain tools was part of the Atlantic civilization and Western civilization at that time in the, in the 18th century. So I, it's really uh, quite important. I'm showing this slide, um, you'll see this afternoon in this desk and bookcase again, but it's one that they made for John Lyon Gardner. And the reason I want to show it is they were so skilled and so clever in using lathes that the pediment of this desk and bookcase was actually turned on the great wheel lathe as a large circle and then cut into four parts. Whereas a city craftsman who couldn't have lathes because he couldn't take the bread out of the mouth of a turner who lived down the street, would have had to use all kinds of planes, saws, and other, and chisels to make uh, this pediment and take a lot, lot longer. Th this is a, a, a great technique that isn't shown in any of the turning encyclopedias of the 18th and early 19th century, but it is carried on still in certain areas of Europe. In the Erzgebirge Mountains of uh, East Germany, uh, many of the wood toys that are made for Noah's Arks are turned in, in moldings in great huge circles. And then they take those circles off the lathe and they cut through, saw through them, and out come giraffes, horses, <laughs> elephants. And it's just very, very quick and cheap and, and very, very efficient. Both Nathaniel IV and V worked as millwrights and derived significant income from the construction and repair of windmills and sawmills on the north and south forks of Long Island. Eight windmills, at least eight windmills built by them still survived, including the 1806 hook mill built by Nathaniel V. Nathaniel V uh, thanks to Dean Faley's research, built a double-geared sawmill for Captain William Rison of Sag Harbor at a cost of 23 pounds, two shillings, for 42 days of work. The mill was dismantled and was shipped to Honduras, where Captain Rison owned a mahogany grove. So thorough was Nathaniel V's knowledge about mill construction that in 1810, he sent a complete set of written instructions for building a windmill to a craftsman in Southhold. On your left is a carpenter's trimming axe of wrought iron that dates quite early, dates about 1725 to 1750, and it's a tool that was probably made in the Netherlands. And on your right is a detail from a depiction of the Holy Family, <coughs> Uh, from a uh, Carmelite manuscript in Vil Vilvorden near Brussels, Belgium that dates about 1500. Nathaniel V's accounts contain entries for his journeyman Jeremy laying barn and stable floors. The tool that he used, this wrought iron axe about two feet long with maker's initials IC stamped in a shield was probably owned by Nathaniel Dominey III, who is, of course, described in deeds as a carpenter. In With Hammer in Hand, I speculated that this ax was of English origin and was perhaps used by carpenters, shipwrights, or wheelwrights. But about 10 years after the publication of With Hammer in Hand, Winnetour acquired the complete photograph collection assembled by Joseph Graeber for his book, Die Geschichte des Hobels, History of the Woodworking Plane, and, or well, Woodworking Tools. And in that collection is this photograph, as a photograph of this wood engraving that was printed in the Carmelite manuscript of about 1500, and it shows a carpenter using an identical ax to trim a floorboard. Since that discovery, correspondence with tool collectors who purchased identical axes in the Netherlands and an article illustrating similar axes cut into gravestones of carpenters and tile plaques 
on houses occupied by carpenters in Holland leaves, I think, no doubt that the tool was probably acquired by Nathaniel III from a Dutch craftsman in New York City or on Long Island. Thus, this survival, like so many tools in the Dominic collection, helped to document, helps to document woodworking technology transferred from Western Europe to colonial America. I also like to, to use it because it shows there is no last word <laughs> on research. And something that you think you've got good and complete information for at one period, uh, later on something else turns up and gives you a completely different idea of what was uh, involved. Another major source of income for the Dominies was gun repair and the stocking of guns. The pattern for a gun stock was made by either Nathaniel V or Felix Domini. It's difficult to fix a date for the pattern, but its length is remarkably close to that of the breech-loading flintlock rifle patented by John Hall in 1811. That rifle was adopted for production on a large scale by the United States Army in 1819. Hall's rifle is 53 inches long, and the pattern measures 53 and a half inches. Felix Domini was active in the militia from about 1817 to 1835, rising to the rank of colonel. And that may have been another reason he had access to and, and was able to get customers uh, for stocking many of these new rifles that were uh, um, adopted by the U.S. Army in 1819. Here you see for Gardner Miller uh, an account in 1815 for stocking a gun as well as uh, fixing a gun lock. Well, this morning I think I've demonstrated, or I has, at least I hope I've demonstrated, that the Domini craftsmen were a known quantity as a family with a long history of residence in East Hampton and a known quantity as the producer of goods. Nathaniel Domini II was a weaver and surveyor. He supervised building of the town's first, the township's first poorhouse and was a partner in a local sawmill. Nathaniel III functioned as a joiner, carpenter, and surveyor, and perhaps, according to family history, but we have no evidence for it, as a clockmaker. Nathaniel IV worked as a joiner, carpenter, cabinet maker, turner, millwright, clockmaker, and a repairer of jewelry, guns, and watches. Nathaniel V was a cabinet maker, a turner, a joiner, millwright, wheelwright, and repairer of small boats. Felix functioned as a clockmaker, repairer of watches and jewelry, and a general metalworker and woodworker. What the local community needed in the way of woodwork or metalwork, the Dominies provided for well over 100 years. It was a recipe for success in earning a living as craftsmen. And so this afternoon, I hope, not hope, we will explore what the community needed and wanted in the way of furniture. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Richard. And um, again, I, I'm just constantly today amazed on this glorious, glorious Saturday in May to find not only you were here this morning, but almost all of you are still here this <laughs> afternoon as well. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, before examining new discoveries of Domini made furniture, I think a brief description of the nature of the research related to this subject is in order. My earlier work was based on the use of templates, patterns for furniture parts that survived in the Domini tool collection. And it was also based on an index of surviving Domini accounts, which told us for whom he made furniture, and comparison of Domini family-owned furniture acquired by Wintertour, taking that furniture and comparing it with furniture called to my attention by local 
families and local family histories. The new discoveries rely on, on those approaches as well, but are supplemented by intensive genealogical research, almost all of it on the part of Glenn Purcell and, and Charles Keller, and comparison of Domini shop practices. And that has enabled us to put flesh, or if you will, wood, on forms previously only known as entries in Domini accounts. I have to tell you that from the time they first uh, contacted me with questions like, could this possibly be a Domini stand? Could this possibly be a Domini table? Boy. <laughs> The computer ink people and computer paper people <laughs> are really happy <laughs> with us because we burned up more computer ink and paper printing out images of possibles uh, over that period of time. And I have stacks and stacks and stacks of, of images uh, that have come through in email. Well, the result is that it can now be demonstrated that the Domini's customers and the craftsmen who stayed with traditional Queen Anne and Chippendale period design up to about 1800 began to demand furniture incorporating federal and empire period design ideas in the 19th century. In order to put into context the furniture produced by Nathaniel Domini IV, his son Nathaniel V, and his son Felix, all working in East Hampton from about 1760 to 1850, we did examine this morning their economic, social, and cultural backgrounds. <laughs> Colonial America, as I pointed out, and the New Republic constituted an overwhelmingly agricultural society. Traditionally, agricultural societies are conservative. Its citizens are prone to spend money relating to what put bread on their tables. Land, livestock, agricultural tools and equipment, seed, hired or slave labor, and yes, a lot of farmers on eastern Long Island own slaves. There are quite a few uh, slaves and interestingly, probably a third, maybe, uh, well, a quarter, or maybe as many as a third of the Domini's customers who own watches also were slave owners. <laughs> At any rate, material goods, except for the most prosperous farmers, generally were of secondary importance. That's not where they were going to put, put their money. Suffolk County, Long Island, and East Hampton Township were not exceptions. During the years of the Dominic Craftsman's activity, three observers, Lyman Beecher, John Lyon Gardner and Timothy Dwight gave us a picture of the physical setting in which the craftsmen worked and the character of the people they served. Beecher was pastor of the Presbyterian Church in East Hampton Village from 1799 to 1810. John Lyon Gardner was the seventh proprietor of Gardner's Island, the wealthiest man in the township and a very fine amateur historian. Timothy Dwight was president of Yale College. John Lyon Gardner made notes and observations on East Hampton in 1798, and he concluded that nothing more than usual for all country towns has taken place in East Hampton for the century past. Remote from the capital, they have lived plain agricultural lives and generally happy. In his autobiography, Lyman Beecher recalled that East Hampton Village consisted of the plainest farmhouses standing on its main street. Their barns were close by, also standing on the street. The road consisted of two ruts worn through the green turf for the wheels of their wagons or carts, and two narrow paths for the horses. The only trees in the place, and this is hard to really believe, but the only trees in the place were a line of poplars between two of the principal residences and a large elm standing at an enormous height. He stated that much of the, uh, more than one half of the township inhabitants made no other journey than coming to church on Sundays. There was not a store in town 
and all our purchases were made in New York by a small schooner that ran once a week. And he's referring there to the Isaacs family schooner that I mentioned <coughs> this morning that made that trip once a week into New York City. He indicated that all the houses in the village had sanded floors, some worn through. Now, you have to take Beecher's remarks with a very, very large dose of salt. Beecher hated being assigned to East Hampton. <laughs> he thought this was beneath him. Timothy Dwight of Yale assigned him to the Presbyterian Church in East Hampton, but he thought his abilities and his station in life merited a large church in one of the major cities. So he had nothing but disdain and disappointment from the time that he was assigned to the Presbyterian Church in East Hampton. And so you really have to, you really have to be careful in taking what he has to say about East Hampton and its inhabitants as gospel. This is a broadside or a print of Yale College and the College Chapel that was made in 1786. And of course, Timothy Dwight was the president of Yale. Traveled through East Hampton in 1811. He described it as having an ancient Presbyterian church, an academy, Linton Academy, and about 100 dwelling houses generally of long standing. I saw but a single new one. Scarcely any of them are painted. Here again, it's the president of Yale College. What does he know about architecture in seaside towns and towns that are near the ocean? Why would you paint it when the salt air is just going to, to uh, do damage to it? It's, it's for, forever. People living in, in uh, seaports and seaside towns have uh, covered their houses with cedar shingles because the cedar shingles darken and wear and, and they last for a long time and you don't paint <laughs> cedar shingle. But Timothy Dwight, as smart as he was, smart enough to be president of Yale College, just did, didn't understand that, didn't know it. He said there is no want of the social character, but it is regulated by the long continued customs of this single spot and by the mutable fashions of a great city or the powerful influence of an extensive country. Living by themselves more than the people of most other places, their own customs, especially those of which have come down from their ancestors, have a commanding influence on their conduct. In analyzing the Dominie's furniture production, we have to take into account four factors. The initial isolation, tradition, the fact of an agricultural community, and then growing prosperity for farmers in the post-revolution era. They all have to be kept in mind in uh, taking a hard look at the furniture produced by the Dominies. And you do have to understand that many of these new discoveries in the federal and empire period style are the result of the fact that farmers after the American Revolution are, are in uh, the driver's seat they become very, very prosperous. Land values begin to rise, and there's such a demand with the growing population and growing trade that's now unfettered uh, because they, <coughs> merchants can trade on their own without the English mercantile laws. So agricultural products uh, uh, are in great demand, and farmers are doing quite well, and they begin to spend some more money on more fashionable kinds of furniture. You'll still be looking at country versions of these styles, but nevertheless, they're no longer the older traditional Queen Anne and Chippendale period styles. Craftsmen had to work smart, and they had to work fast if they were to make a product that would suit their customers' pocketbooks and needs. It's not surprising, therefore, that the dominies most often made use of their lathes to produce furniture. Of the 1,300 plus pieces of furniture, spinning wheels, reels, and coffins made between 1760 and 1850, about 800, about 800, were turned in whole 
or in part on their lands. Maybe some of you know that the original Doric columns on the piazza of this academy, Clinton Academy, were turned by the Dominies on one of those lathes that you just saw in, in the slide. More than 380 chairs are recorded in Dominie accounts. And of that number, 61 are listed as slatback or slat chairs. They were the least expensive of chairs made by craftsmen everywhere in America. Their cost from the Dominie shop ranging from only four shillings to about six shillings a piece. The former price undoubtedly referred to the two slat side chair type, like the example on your left, made by Nathaniel V between 1810 and 1820. A pattern for the slats dated in the 18 teens survives in the Dominie tool collection. The relationship between New England centers bordering on Long Island Sound and Dominie production in East Hampton is illustrated by comparison with a double slat side chair that you see on the right made in Milford, Connecticut about 1770. The very conservative nature of the Dominie's customers is well illustrated by the timeless quality of this slat back armchair made by Nathaniel V in 1822 for Abraham Sherrill. Its price was 14 shillings. It and other examples of Dominie made furniture were obtained by Winterthur from Sherrill Foster of East Hampton, a direct descendant of Abraham Sherrill. And here you see two views of Irene Sherrill, two and a half years old, in that great chair that was made for Abraham Sherrill at a cost of 14 shillings and is now uh, at Winterthur. Amateur woodworks, woodworkers, and even some contemporary professionals often scoff at statements about the speed with which the Dominies and other, other early craftsmen produced furniture and other objects. During the working period of the Dominies, materials were expensive and labor was cheap. That's exactly the reverse of today when generally labor is expensive and materials are, are much less expensive. Long years served as apprentices, journeymen, and master craftsmen gave men like the Dominies a sure touch in the use of tools and manipulation of wood. Labor-saving devices like this slat-bending clamp that you see on your left, made by Nathaniel Dominie V, and the spoon bit on your right, extended for a special purpose by a local blacksmith, hastened the process of cutting, shaping, and assembling furniture. Like their counterparts, the Dominies worked 10 to 12 hours every day, six days of each week. So they're working 60 to 72 hours every week. When Nathaniel IV began working about 1758, he charged five shillings a day for his labor. By 1769, that went up by six pence, five shillings, six pence. And in the 1770s, seven shillings. And from the 1790s on, he and his son charged only seven shillings, six pence, roughly equivalent to one dollar per day for their labor. That's those master craftsmen. Using a formula of one-third for labor, one-third for materials, and one-third for profit, which was what woodworkers used to calculate the prices for their products, we can calculate how much time was spent on making their furniture. Their two and three slat side chairs were completed in two to three hours. Two to three hours. Abraham Sherrill's great chair that you saw on the screen, one of eight that they made between 1790 and 1822, was ready for delivery in less than eight hours of work. Wouldn't you like to be able to go into a furniture store today and commission your product and say, I want it in eight hours? <laughs>
Among the 17 rocking armchairs made by Nathaniel V between 1804 and 1830 is this slapback example made for his own household in 1796. Because of the short armrests, a support was needed which extended through the seat rail to the side stretchers. The extended spoon bit that we just saw in a recent slide was a perfect solution for drilling the mortise holes in both with speed and accurate alignment. Just one, uh, one effort, one movement, and he's got both holes drilled instead of having to drill them separately and, and taking time to make sure that they lined up, get perfect alignment. On occasion, Nathaniel V made rocking armchairs with curved arch slats, as on this example, also made for family use in 1809. Fiddleback rocking armchairs were also made in the Domini shop between 1790 and 1830. But a note of caution, account books and day books do not always clarify furniture forms for us or answer all questions. For example, on March 15, 1809, Abraham Edwards was billed 12 shillings to a great rocking chair. While another client was billed 14 shillings for a rocking chair. One might assume that something described as great would be worth more. Moreover, in 1804, John Lyon Gardner is billed for two rocking chairs, one pound, 12 shillings, or 16 shillings apiece. Were the materials different? Was a wealthier client charged what the traffic would bear? Did Nathaniel V pass along an extra cost for making his first rocking chairs? What were the differences between a 12 shilling, 14 shilling, and 16 shilling rocking chair? I wish I could tell you, but Nathaniel V's accounts don't give us a clue. We just don't know. But surviving Domini tools like the chair bit on your left tell us a great deal about their work habits and processes. In late 18th and early 19th century English tool catalogs, Bits like this one on your left were described as chair types, available in 3 8 and 5 8 inch sizes. Nathaniel V used it to drill holes in chair styles to receive the tenons of armrests, seat rails, and stretchers. The stop provided by the pearwood shank limited the mortise hole depth to one and one quarter inches. So he got exact depth that he wanted whenever he drilled those holes. The round tenons at the end of armrests, stretchers, seat rails, and spindles could be quickly shaped with these tenon or plug cutting bits, each cutting a different size diameter. Present day owners of Domini chairs comment about the tightness of the chair parts. The Domini's construction method, flattening one side of a tenon, uh, to receive the rounded surface of another. You see in this x-ray of the Domini uh, armchair, this rounded surface below this mortise hole, and then you turn, put the flattened tenon in, which rests in that curve. So doing that, flattening one side of a tenon to receive the rounded surface of another in interlocking mortise holes, and using wet mortises with dry tenons to help lock or tighten the joints, what happens is you get a wet mortise, the hole is wet, you put a dry tenon in it, what happens? The dry tenon absorbs the moisture and expands and locks it in very tightly. So that was a trick known not only to the Dominies but to many 18th century chair makers and helps to account for the sturdiness of their chairs. Over 200 chairs are listed in Domini accounts between 1766 and 1840 with no other descriptive term, just chairs. <laughs> they ranged in price from one shilling sixpence to 10 shillings. And in recent years, 
The type that you see on the left, uh, a dominie chair, and that is a dominie splatback chair. This type of chair, side chair, has been called a splatback, a Hudson Valley type, a York chair, and fiddleback. It's not a fiddleback, but they have been called fiddleback chairs. Between 1740 and 1830 or so, they were made from Albany, New York, and here you see the ad of a chair maker, James Chesney, in Albany in an 18-4 advertisement, and there's a splatback chair still being made in Albany in 1804. So they were made from Albany to northern New Jersey and east to Southold and East Hampton, Long Island. We may never know what 18th and early 19th century makers or owners called them. The term York occurs among Connecticut furniture makers, probably referring to this type of New York chair. It's a type made by Nathaniel V between 1790 and 1830. My best guess is that the splatback chair was like one of the chairs made for L. Nathan Parsons, Aaron Isaacs, or David Talmadge Jr. in 1790 and 1791 at a price of eight shillings each. And that guess is based on prices charged for other specific types of chairs made by the Dominies. The patterns or templates for the crest rail and splat of that type of chair were among important survivals in the Dominic Tool Collection. Patterns for the armrests of armchairs, splats and crest rails for fiddleback chairs, and York chairs, slat patterns and a pattern used for both the armrest of a corner chair and a low-back Windsor armchair are in this particular group. There are at least 31 notations for fiddleback chairs from 1796 to 1808. <coughs> On November 18, 1808, for example, we have Jonathan Stratton being billed for six fiddleback chairs at seven shillings, nine pence. That was undoubtedly like this newly discovered side chair with a Montaukett brush seat pattern, which I'm glad to say is in the collections of the East Hampton Historical Society. It probably dates about 1795 to 18, 1810. Armchairs would have cost twice as much Helping to document this chair on your left, acquired by Wintertour in 1993, is the survival of the pattern for its crest rail and splat in the Domini tool collection. The dealer who sold it to Wintertour, Morgan McWinney, specializes in furniture made on Long Island. In 1972, he obtained it in Sag Harbor, part of East Hampton Township. On your right is a portrait of a member of the Lahamadu family. We don't know which Lahamadu. Seated in a Domini fiddleback armchair. And I realize it's dim, but you may have to take my word for it that he is seated in a Domini fiddleback <coughs> armchair. And that's a, a painting that was done by Her Hubbard Latham Fordham in 1833. Fordham was a later resident of Sag Harbor. And the Domini accounts contain many entries from members of the Lahamadu, Fordham, and Latham families. Part of the diverse woodworking skills of the Dominies was millwright's work. Among the mills they built was a double-geared sawmill I mentioned this morning for Captain William Rison of Sag Harbor, a wealthy ship merchant, ship owner, merchant, and owner of a mahogany grove in Honduras. If not for the chiseled inscription under the seat of this low-back Windsor armchair and survival of the pattern for its combination crest rail and armrest, no one would know that it was part of a set made by Nathaniel V in 1794 for Captain Rysom at a cost of 10 shillings each. The price was undoubtedly due to Rysom's supplying the mahogany. Mahogany Windsor chairs and capstan chairs are scarce as hen teeth. There were very, very few that were made uh, originally. But Rysom owned a mahogany grove, and he was going to have a set of mahogany uh, captain, so-called captain's chairs or Windsor armchairs. 
The wood was not often used by the dominies because few of their customers would pay for the use of the most expensive furniture wood. And we know um, from lots of accounts that there was a definite price hierarchy for wood. Mahogany was the most expensive. You paid more for something made of mahogany. Walnut was next most expensive. Then cherry, then maple, then, uh, po then pine, and last of all, poplar was the cheapest uh, wood used to make a piece of, of furniture. So you had a definite price pricing hierarchy in the wood that was used. Although ricin is listed in Domini accounts, here's another example, no entry appears for this set of chairs. Another warning that we cannot rely solely on ledger information. Ricin's 202-ton brig was aptly named Merchant. He also owned a rope walk, a shipyard, and a pier in Sag Harbor. A newly discovered corner chair in the East Hampton Historical Society's collection may have been made by Nathaniel V for Jonathan Mulford about 1800. Its crest rail and armrests match those on the Ricem captain's chair and a corner chair that's published in with hammer in hand that I think was at the time owned in the Wheelock family. The term Windsor never appears in Domini records, but this arrowback Windsor side chair with bamboo shaped legs was removed in 1946 from the Domini house in East Hampton by a daughter of the last member of the Domini family who lived in that house. It's also shown in a recently discovered old photograph of the Domini woodworking shop, a photograph that's owned by the East Hampton Historical Society, and there's a view through the woodworking shop into the kitchen of the Domini house, and this chair is seated right in the center of that kitchen uh, view. Phoebe Domini Mason sold it to Winterthur in 1967. The child's rocking side chair was also removed from that house in 1946 by Phoebe Domini Mason. Her daughter sold it to Winterthur in 1992. At least 29 small chairs were made by Nathaniel IV and V between 1773 at 1832, presumably for the use of children. And here again, in the ledgers, it, it's a riot because he lists small chairs and he lists little chairs in the accounts, and both the small chairs and the little chairs were exactly the same price. So they probably were the same type of chair, but just using a different term um, maybe in haste or for whatever reason at the time he made those entries in, in the accounts. They ranged in price from three shillings to eight shillings. The rocking side chair that you see on the right was probably made by Nathaniel V for his grandson, Nathaniel VII, who was born in 1827 and died in 1910. Now, keep in mind these features as we move along, this type of stretcher, the bamboo turned legs, the shape of the seat, these arrowback uh, splats or slats, the curvature of the rear styles and the flattening of the ends, which you see, same thing happening on this child's chair, same thing happening here. And we're going to see that, I think, in the next group. So the relationship of the Windsor chair made by the Domini family, or made for Domini family use, to the chair on your left, I think, is clear. See it in the stretcher, bamboo turnings, shape of the seat, same type of arrowback splats, the same bending of the rear styles and flattening off the tip of the rear styles. That chair on your left is one of a set of four probably made for John Hunting in 1803. In his accounts, he never refers, as I said, to Windsor chairs. But 
He simply referred to the 22 Windsor chairs like this that he made for four different customers between 1800 and 1803 as green chairs. <laughs> the green is well faded now on the surface, but if you look where that has chipped, you can see the original very dark green paint that was originally used by the Dominies for uh, those chairs. The same relationship, uh, incidentally, these chairs cost 10 shillings each, and that's probably about two to four shillings cheaper than if that chair had been made in a city area by a city craftsman, because that's about the price city craftsmen charge for Windsor chairs, 12 to 14 shillings. <coughs> The same relationship in the arrowbacks, stretcher, seat design, and bamboo turned legs can be seen in a Windsor armchair on the right, um, which is probably made by Nathaniel Dominey V between 1815 and 1825. But the painted decoration is not attributed to the Dominies. It's probably an example of a later attempt to make it into a fancy chair. A writing arm Windsor that's in the East Hampton Historical Society's collections and I think is on view upstairs was made by Nathaniel V between 1800 and 1830, possibly for a schoolmaster at Clinton Academy. Its features again are those used by Nathaniel V on the Windsors just seen and the John Hunting set that's seen on your right. This maple side chair on your left, one of six, made for Abraham Parsons Jr. in 1814, is only one example of some of Nathaniel V's customers wanting more fashionable furniture. And it's in a, the a country empire period style. His willingness and his customers' willingness to break away from traditional design styles, I think, is important. This chair and the remainder of the set descended in the Sherrill family. And on your right, you can see Edwin Sherrill and his sister, Sherrill Foster, in a 1932 view in a similar, if not one of the same chairs from this set. With the exception of the Empire period splat, another pair of maple side chairs has a strong resemblance to the set made for Abraham Parsons Jr. in 1814. Side chairs made in the new style earned Nathaniel V nine shillings each, up from five or six shillings charged for slatback side chairs and eight shillings charged for fiddleback side chairs. Nathaniel Dominey IV and V made at least 73 bedsteads of various types between 1768 in 1833, and this is really one of the exciting new discoveries because we knew they made bedsteads, but we had no idea what they, what they looked like until recently. The bulk of them were made by Nathaniel V. So it's only recently with new discoveries linking original ownership with style and decorative motifs that's enabled the identification of bedstead entries from the craftsman's <coughs> accounts. The nine bedstead posts that are shown in this comparison slide on your left are from bedsteads made by Nathaniel V between 1809 and 1818 for members of the Edwards, Hunting, Talmadge, and Sherrill families, plus a few still to be linked to specific individuals. Coupled with a comparison slide of the foot turnings on bedsteads linked to specific entries in Dominic accounts, the turning vocabulary used by Nathaniel V can be well established. All of the bedsteads from which these slides were made are still owned by local families or by the East Hampton Historical Society. And some of the headboards used by Nathaniel V for his bedsteads are shown at the left with details uh, showing the ram's horns that were used on many of his headboards at the right. These decorative features and turnings can be found on the Dominey bedsteads that follow. At the left is a trundle bedstead, 
one of seven made by Nathaniel V between 1790 and 1815. It's in the collection of Bess Ratray and was probably made for Jonathan Mulford, Jr. in 1802 for 14 shillings. On your right is a bedstead also owned by Bess Ratray, entered as to bedstead short posts for David Miller in 1804 at a cost of 16 shillings. Both of the bedsteads now on the screen were made by Nathaniel V for members of the Sherrill family in 1809. The cherry bedstead on the left was probably made for David Sherrill at a cost of two pounds, eight shillings, while the maple example on your right was probably made for recompense Sherrill in 1809 at a price of two pounds. Recovered from the Talmadge home on Main Street, the short post bedstead on your left still retains its original ochre paint. It was made for David Talmadge II in 1810 at a cost of 14 shillings. <coughs> the Domini accounts describe it simply as, quote, a painted short post bedstead, unquote. At the right is another short post bedstead made by Nathaniel V in 1812, possibly for Nathaniel Hand at a charge of 18 shilling. Nathaniel V recorded 11 long post bedsteads in his account and day books. The example on your left was probably made for Lieutenant Thomas Baker in 1816 for two pounds, and the remains of a long post bedstead and teasters, possibly fashioned for Jonathan Mulford in 1819 at a cost of two pounds, 16 shillings, are in the East Hampton Historical Society uh, collection. That's on the right. The one on the left, that uh, bedstead probably made for Lieutenant Thomas Baker, uh, is in the collections of Helen Ratray. The East Hampton Historical Society is also fortunate to own the bedstead posts and headboard shown on the left, and the rare bedstead illustrated at the right. On March 16, 1818, Nathaniel V billed John Parsons, Jr., two pounds, eight shillings, for the only long and reeded posts and teasters entered into his accounts. The teasters and side rails are apparently missing. For Abraham Sherrill, Jr., also in 1818, Nathaniel V made the equally rare bedstead with a joint to turn up. This, this piece of labor, uh, space-saving furniture is so incredibly rare that <laughs> when I got an email picture of this and was told that it was in the East Hampton Historical Society, my wife wondered what all the screaming was about <laughs> from the lower level <laughs> of our home. But here you can see in this blow-up, um, We've got, here it is, to a bedstead with a joint to turn up, one pound, eight shillings, right, right there in the Dominic count for um, Abraham Charles Jr. I, I know of only one or two other bedsteads that survive with a joint to turn up, and they all are very, fairly elaborate. Uh, bedsteads that um, the legs and, and rails pa uh, partially fold up underneath the canopy of the bed. This particular one, these legs are held in place not with pins. They can be pulled off and then you simply lift these up against the wall, store the legs underneath and it's out of the way. It's really a great, great piece of furniture and it shows the ingenuity of the Dominies in solving a problem for a family where there were lots and lots of children all of a sudden in very small, very small spaces. In 1796, Nathaniel Dominey made furniture for his family's use, among which was this long chest on your left for which he charged himself 10 shillings. It's now, well, he had to account. You see, his father was still alive. This is what I was getting at. He had to account to his father for time he spent on his own furniture for his own family's use. 
It's now installed in the reconstructed Dominey Woodworking Shop at Winnetor. And it's also seen in this recently discovered old photograph of the Dominey Woodworking Shop that's owned by the East Hampton Historical Society. The Dominies patronized East Hampton blacksmiths who probably made the identical or very similar strap hinges that appear on Dominie made blanket and so-called sea captain's uh, chests. Between 1768 and 1822, Nathaniel IV and V made 58 chests. Most made by Nathaniel V, variously described as plain, small, long, large, complicated, and meal trough, but never as sea captain. Does that mean that none of these chests were ever used by sea captains? Of course not. But sea captain is probably a term that we've come to use in the late 19th and 20th century because of association of ownerships with people who were sea captains. They were storage furniture and the simplest form of storage furniture that, uh, that could be made by a joiner or a cabinet maker. The chest on your left is quite similar to one owned by Felix Domini that's pictured in Dean Faley's Long Island is My Nation. And it was probably made for David Hedges in 1799 at a modest cost of 10 shillings. But the complicated chest seen on your right was made for John Parsons III in 1792, costing one pound six shillings. That's really 16 shillings more than, than this one on the left. Owing to the complicated till, drawers, partitions of its interior, and a grade of wood above pine. And here you see the interior of the Parsons complicated chest. Uh, there are drawers underneath the till on this side, partitions on this side, and other space for bottles here that this lid slides over to cover the bottles when they're, when they're in place. A nice, really nice piece of furniture. Nathaniel V also made blanket chests with one or two drawers. A total of 12 are so described in the accounts between 1786 and 1812. The recently discovered example on your left, like one at Home Street Home, that I illustrated in With Hammer in Hand, was probably made for Nathan Miller in 1800 at a cost of one pound 14 shillings. The two drawer example at the right, owned by the East Hampton Historical Society, exhibits a bracket foot pattern that survives in the Domini tool collection and has moldings found on other case furniture made by Nathaniel V. And then an unusual piece of case furniture is this bottle case that was made for Abraham Sherrill Jr. in 1802. And it's the only chest form of that type listed by Nathaniel V in his accounts. He and his father made various pieces of furniture for nine Sherrill family members over a 60 year period between 1769 and 1829. The 13 chests upon chests made by Nathaniel V between 1791 and 1806 made use of a leg pattern that has survived in the Domini tool collection. Depending on the wood used, they ranged in price from seven pounds, 12 shillings, six pence to 12 pounds. And the biggest reason for the expense was the number of drawers that had to be constructed and the dovetails associated with the construction of those drawers. The one on the screen was made in 1796 for Nathaniel V's family at a cost of 10 pounds and was bought out of the Domini house by a resident of Washington, D.C. who had a home in Southampton and is now owned by her son. There's an interesting story in connection with this double chest. And you know, when I was doing research on With Hammer in Hand, people kept asking me, have you seen the Domini high chest? Have you seen the Domini high chest? 
said, no, I haven't seen the Domini High Chest. Where is that? I don't know, but have you seen the Domini High Chest? And I began to think they were pulling my leg. I, it never existed until actually uh, a, about a year and a half later, uh, I was able to track it down. That's a long story that I'm not going to go into to, uh, now. All of the chests on chests, and he called them chests upon chests, never referred to them as a high chest of drawers, always a chest upon chest. And technically, of course, that's what they are, a chest upon chest. Um, this one, and, and they're all virtually identical. Uh, this example was purchased in 1992 by Winterthur, and um, we were very happy and very pleased to get it. And if you could have seen in that dark black and white slide, make it out, you could have seen it had exactly the same curved skirt, the fleur de lis pendant, the same type of leg and, and uh, Queen Anne pad foot, flat top, etc. The same Domini bracket foot pattern that survived in the tool collection was used to support these two case pieces. The double chest that's on the left, now on loan to the East Hampton Historical Society, is an exciting new discovery. Although Nathaniel V made 17 four-drawer chests of drawers, for which he used the late 18th century term bureau to describe them, only one entry appears in his accounts that seems to describe this form on your left. In 1800, he billed Hunting Miller 18 pounds for mahogany drawers. Because Nathaniel V's bureau sold for between five pounds to 10 pounds, and the chests upon chests, seven pounds to 12 pounds, mahogany drawers at 18 pounds would seem to be a reference to a double chest of drawers. At this point, the original owner of this Domini double chest is not known. And a complicating factor is it's not made out of mahogany. It's made out of cherry. <laughs> but I've said that we can't rely solely on entries in anybody's accounts, much less the Domini. So perhaps one day we'll find out for whom this piece was originally made. The fact that it's a Domini piece I think is indisputable because it has every characteristic in the pattern of the feet, the construction of the drawers, the use of moldings that appear on other case pieces. So we, we don't doubt that it was made by Nathaniel Domini V, but we just don't know for whom it was originally made. The desk and bookcase on your right was probably made by Nathaniel Domini IV for his brother Henry before 1796. In that year, Henry Domini moved to Beekmantown, New York. It descended in the Domini family to Washington Tyson Domini and recently was sold out of the family. And thanks to Morgan McWinning and the Habers' wonderful cocktail party last night, Morgan told me where that desk and bookcase is now, so at least I'm able to track it down. But note what even a member of the Domini family was doing to the original dark stain that was placed uh, deliberately on this piece. He had started to remove it to get at the very, very nice cherry wood underneath the, the stain when I saw it and visited uh, with him. He had gotten through only the the three drawers, and my hope is that it's still at least in this condition and the rest of the stain hasn't been, been uh, removed. Now this one, this one was made for um, uh, John Lyon Gardner in 1800 by Nathaniel Domini V. And here you see the entry in the accounts, John L. Gardner to desk, bookcase, and carting it to fireplace 20 pounds, eight shillings, the most expensive piece of furniture that Nathaniel Domini uh, made. When I saw this, um, in, when I first saw it, I saw it in the home of Winthrop Gardner Jr., its owner at the time, and its original stain had already been removed to get at the maple wood underneath. Collectors in the 20th century, maybe because we're so used to plastics, but they just can't stand not seeing 
real wood. So <laughs> often on country furniture, which was deliberately stained to make it look like a more expensive wood, they remove that. And then the form is still there, but the original intent of the maker is, is, uh, and the owner is gone uh, by that time. So at 20 pounds, eight shillings, it's the most expensive furniture form made by Nathaniel V. And despite a replaced finial and replaced feet and loss of its original red stain, Winotour acquired it from uh, the Gardner family in 1992. In examining the desk in Winterthur's furniture conservation studios, a remnant of the original red stain was found on the lopers for the desk. You know, the lopers are the things you pull out to support the full front uh, lid of a desk or a desk and bookcase. And this is the way it now looks with that red stain restored to the desk and bookcase. In 1765, Nathaniel IV had purchased 14 pounds of Spanish brown, a dark reddish brown pigment with lots of iron oxide in it. And in 1773, he bought a quantity of argil, A-R-G-A-L, a crude tartar, also used as a pigment for reddish brown colors. The influence of Rhode Island desks and bookcases in the fielded panels in the pediment in the enclosed uh, broken arch pediment um, and covered uh, pediment is very, very clear. And the form of the desk itself, very much Rhode Island uh, influence. And that influence on Nathaniel V was very strong when he made this desk and bookcase. Now, he not only made these big giants, but he also made small desks that he called school desks. And so the piece on the left with its interior shown on the right, that descended in the Parsons and Sherrill families. It was made for Abraham Sherrill Jr. in 1801 at a cost of 17 shillings. The ram's horn and Sima curve uh, splashboard in various sizes was used by Nathaniel V on bedsteads, clock case pediments, washstands, and other furniture forms. Although the craftsman specifically referred to this piece as a school desk, judging from the prices listed, he also referred to them as writing desks between 1795 and 1801 for those made for the Parsons, Edwards, and Dayton families. To save money, Joel Miller and David Hedges shared one school or writing desk, each charge for half the total cost. Scrimping further, Abraham Edwards, Abraham Hunting, and Thomas Tillinghast, Tillinghast divvied up the cost of one school desk in the same year. <laughs> One of them paying for each, each of them paying for, um, the two of them paying for a quarter of the cost, and one paying for a half of the cost, and then apparently sharing the same, same desk. I don't know whether they had rotated school hours or what. How they got to do this is a mystery to me, but that's the way they were charged in the accounts. When Winotour acquired this looking glass from Cheryl Foster in 1992, it came with a history of ownership by Abraham Sherrill. There are only eight entries in Domini accounts to looking glass frames, none of which is for that ancestor of Sherrill Foster. Given the survival of patterns and cutouts for the surround of the looking glass itself, uh, given, those, given those survivals in the Domini tool collection, it's much more likely that it is the, quote, one frame to looking glass entered by Nathaniel V in the furniture he made for family use at a price of one pound four shillings in 1796. All of the other looking glass frame entries are for small frames, much lower in price. My take on its existence in the Sherrill family, and I'm not saying this is absolute, but it's my speculation that its existing existence in the Sherrill family 
is due to the strong likelihood that it was inherited by Urania Domini, one of Nathaniel V's daughters who married Elnathan Parsons, and then the glass came into the Sherrill family through intermarriage. And after all, that was the East Hampton way, that you had <laughs> to have those things come through intermarriage into and through different, different families. At first glance, this entire looking glass also appears to have been made by Nathaniel V. Actually, it represents additions made by him in 1796 to an original English veneered interior, English veneered frame looking glass. On March 12, 1796, Nathaniel V listed Nathan Mulford as a debtor in the amount of two shillings, quote, to ornaments to looking glass, unquote, adding another six shillings to that debt the next month in April 1796 with the entry to repair desk and looking glass frame, unquote. Lathe turn work is always a hallmark of rural cabinet work, and Nathaniel Domini V used his shop lathes to make at least 82 stands between 1789 and 1833. Most, fortunately, are still in East Hampton Village in the township or nearby Long Island communities. The cherry stand on your left in a private collection was bought in Sag Harbor, while the mahogany stand at the right, made for John Lyon Gardner in 1799, stayed in East Hampton Village in the Gardner family for many years. Both are illustrated in With Hammer in Hand, and the template for their legs survives in the Domini Tool Collection. Those stands are used as reference points to identify a striped maple example on your left, made by Nathaniel V for Jacob Sherrill in 1789, and on your right, a stand in the East Hampton Historical Society's collection. The latter's column resembles that on a tea table made by Nathaniel V for Sylvester Deering, illustrated in With Hammer in Hand. Another stand owned by the East Hampton Historical Society on your left shows the same features associated with Nathaniel Domini V's work, as does the rare book stand at your right. The book stand has lost its molded lip that retained reading material in place, but it's unquestionably the book stand made for Jonathan Mulford in 1793. It's the only such form listed by Nathaniel V. And here you see a detail of the underside with the mechanism that enabled the book stand to be tilted up and then with the molding uh, lip to hold the material in place, uh, it became an easy uh, to use form for reading material. Both of these stands in private collections bear strong similarity to stands owned in recent years by members of the Skellinger and Wheelock families. They're similar to stands number 250 and 251 that I illustrated in With Hammer in Hand. An oval top is used on the stand at the left, which has a broken pendant drop, you can see underneath the column, a feature that appears on one other, one other stand made by uh, Nathaniel V between 1800 and 1815. Its legs and feet were made after a pattern surviving in the Domini tool collection. The spider legs of the square top stand with swept corners, a federal period design used by Nathaniel V for many of his stands, also has legs surviving from a Domini pattern. Both of the stands on the screen were purchased by Wedator from Cheryl Foster in 1992. They came with an original, a history of original ownership by Abraham Sherrill. Unfortunately, a history not corroborated by Domini accounts. It's again more likely that they came into the family through marriage and inheritance. But made over a separation of 20 years or so, they serve to illustrate Nathaniel V's customer's choice of materials, the craftsman's design choices, 
and the fashion con conscious preferences of both. The cherry candle stand on their left, made about 1790, owes its inspiration to the turn columns of Newport examples, while the maple stand at the right, made about 1810 or 1815, shows the turner's use of the then fashionable spider leg with a square top and swept corners popular during the federal period. A stand made for Jacob Hedges, Jr. in 1816, shown at your left, bears a later inscription under its top of Clinton DeWitt Talmadge. Like many stands made by Nathaniel V between 1810 and 1830, it has a short Doric column extending from an urn on its shaft with the usual popular spider legs and square top with swept corners. The stand on the right, owned by the East Hampton Historical Society, has many of the same features, but also incorporates bold disc and spool turning that Nathaniel V began to use on bedsteads and turn parts of his furniture about 1815. Nathaniel V's earliest use of a tapered Egyptian-style column for his turn work was probably on the shafts of a pair of very large mahogany tea tables made for William Hunting in 1810 at a cost of four pounds each. And I was delighted that Helen Ratray, who owns this table, agreed to lend it for the show. You can see it upstairs. But the top is just enormous. And it's, without question, the most expensive and largest tea table that Nathaniel Dominey made. Part of the cost of four pounds that he charged for each of the pair of these tables had to do with the use of mahogany, with the construction of a bird cage that enabled the, the top when it was down to be turned and also to be turned up and tilted up. And also the brass hardware that was necessary to fasten the top when it was uh, in the down position. Here, a detail of the turn pillar of the William Hunting tea table is compared with newel posts turned by Nathaniel V at the Sherrill Farmhouse and at Joy Lewis's home in Sag Harbor. House carpentry was only one of the numerous woodworking activities engaged in by both Nathaniel IV and Nathaniel V. He was able to make so many stands at a reasonable price because of his arbor and cross for turning stands made for him by the local blacksmith David Talmadge Jr. in 1795. In common use by turners in the 18th and early 19th centuries, the Domini example is a unique survival. Only one other is known, and that's in a Swedish collection of a member of the Swedish royal family who in the 18th century was a woodworking hobbyist. <coughs> the tool is not illustrated in any of the encyclopedias and turning manuals published in France and England during the late 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries. So its survival in the Domini tool collection is really in incredibly important. The Domini's cognizance of what was occurring elsewhere is well illustrated by these breakfast tables. On your left is one made by George Woodruff, a New York City cabinet maker working between 1808 and 1816. On the right is one of 13 breakfast tables made by Nathaniel V between 1794 and 1823 at prices ranging from one pound 10 shillings to two pounds 16 shillings. It was probably made for family use at the time of Felix Domini's marriage in 1826. Rescued from the Domini house in 1946 by Robert Domini, a son of Charles M. Domini, the last resident of the house. During the research for With Hammer in Hand, the only Domini tables brought to my attention were the breakfast table rescued by Robert Domini that we just saw and the tea table that was made for Domini family use in 1796. Until now, the listing of 99 tables 
not 99 bottles of beer on the wall, but 99 tables and the Domini accounts had no counterparts in three-dimensional form. Recent discoveries, like the tables now on the screen, are bringing them literally out of the woodwork. <laughs> Nathaniel V recorded only one table with a drawer, a breakfast table made in 1805 for David Miller at a price of 16 shillings. And again, I'm glad to say it's owned by the East Hampton Historical Society. On your right is a dining table in the Morgan Foster collection that was probably entered in Nathaniel V's accounts as one made for Abraham Parsons in 1809 at a cost of one pound 12 shillings. A similar dining table on the left made of costlier wood, tiger striped maple, was probably made for Domini family use by Nathaniel V about 1815. Apparently inherited by Nathaniel Domini VII, it descended through his son Felix Domini, not Felix the clockmaker, but Nathaniel Domini VII's son Felix and his wife Mary. At the right is a dining table made for El Nathan Parsons in 1819, described by Nathaniel V as cherry at a cost of two pounds, eight shillings. And again, one of the unique and only type of tables made by Nathaniel V is this, quote, pine table with one leaf made for Abraham Sherrill in 1819 and still owned by descendants. Its cost was one pound, eight shillings. These one drop leaf tables are incredibly, incredibly rare. Some tables and stands attributed to Nathaniel V because of sawn and turn decoration occurring on other furniture forms made by him are harder to pin down. On the left is a large work table that may be the single entry in Nathaniel V's accounts for a, quote, toilet table made for Jared Hand in 1809. At the right is a corner washstand that came to the East Hampton Historical Society as part of a furniture group with Mulford family history. It might be the stand made for Samuel Mulford in 1818, but at this point, the jury is still out. On, on both pieces. How to sum up the Domini's skills as furniture makers? Like most rural woodworkers, their decoration consisted primarily of wood shaped by lathes, saws, and planes. No carving and almost no veneer work. As one looks at the surviving products of their handiwork, one might question the degree of craft skill possessed by the Domini's. But an excellent article by Philip Zay, director of Historic Deerfield, entitled Diversity and Regionalism in Rural New England Furniture, reinforces my assessment of the Dominies as possessors of superior woodworking skills who are unfortunately not often challenged by their conservative clientele. Zay noted that rural furniture design doesn't reflect ignorance and eccentricity. It does not. He observed that provincial objects can have high el elements of high style and command an expensive price. And we've seen that there was some very expensive furniture made by the Domini. In general, agricultural economies demanded conservative, solid, functional, time-tested objects, unlike the demand for changing mutable fashion in urban economies. The Domini's customers demanded, in quotes, neat, unquote, neat goods. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, in the 18th and early 19th centuries, neat meant elegance of form or arrangement with freedom from all unnecessary additions or embellishment of agreeable but simple appearance, nicely made or proportional. That's a perfect <coughs> summary of Domini made products. And everyone at the time understood what the word neat meant. 
there's, uh, it's a term that you see over and over again in orders for furniture made by George Washington, by Charles Carroll of Carrollton, who was extremely rich. And one of the best examples of the fact that everybody knew its meaning, meaning is in the Domini papers that survived. A lady in Islip sends a letter to Felix Domini. Mr. Domini, I would like to commission you to make me a neat clock. How much will such a clock be? He writes back and all he says was, such a clock will be $80. She wants a neat clock. He knows what she wants in neat. And when he sends her back the fact that, you know, such a clock, he's telling her he knows what she wants. But no specific description other than neat has gone back and forth between them. For almost 75 years, from 1760 to 1835, three generations of Domini craftsmen made an excellent living bartering for items like teacups, rum, calico, tobacco, earthenware, sugar, and business supplies like those shown in Nathaniel Lafort's account book entries on your left. Instead, in his 21st year, when Felix Domini wrote in his weather book, with hammer in hand, all arts do stand, all arts do stand with hammer in hand. He probably thought that he would continue to prosper as a craftsman like his father and grandfather. But Paul Svinin, a Russian artist recording scenes in America during the early 19th century, this is a view dated 1815, a steamboat on the Hudson, he was one of only a number of artists recording the application of steam power to moving boats, trains, and machinery. Goods could be produced cheaper, faster, and greater quantity than was possible in handcraft shops. The well-educated Felix saw technological unemployment looming for him, and his last order, for example, for a tall case clock was in 1828, got none after that date. So he moved to Babylon, Long Island, in order to become a keeper of the Long, of Fire Island Lighthouse in 1835. One of the most beautiful make-do tools in the Domini collection is a 14 and, and a quarter inch, 14 and one quarter inch long turning chisel made by Nathaniel III or IV from the fine steel of a broken sword blade. A floral and leaf design on the blade uh, has the date 1660 in, inlaid in brass on its blade. It bears witness to the long period of time when hand craftsmen like the Dominis produced all of the structures and objects used by consumers. But it also provides sad testimony to the declining fortunes of the Domini family. In 1883, Charles Burr Todd wrote about East Hampton as the new playground of the American Barbizon School of Artists. He described, quote, an old weather-beaten dwelling at the upper end of Village Street, unquote, sketched and painted so often that an in-joke about new artists arriving in town was, quote, Domini's is going on to the canvas, unquote. <laughs> After describing the rundown condition of the house in 1883, Todd noted, quote, two workshops, one flanking each side of the cottage, <clears throat> present curious interiors, low ceilings, dusty, cobweb windows, tools of various callings, disposed on the walls or cribs in the ceiling, more tools, and a medley of articles scattered about, old-fashioned clocks in long cases, a photographer's camera, a Damascus blade with gold inlaid hilt, it wasn't gold, obviously it was brass, fashioned into a chisel, unquote. Winator is fortunate to be the custodian of the major collection of material to the Domini craftsmen. And East Hampton, both East Hampton Township, is, is also fortunate 
to still have so many examples of Domini furniture and clocks. Both offer to moderns the best evidence of what it was like to earn your bread when, with hammer in hand, all arts did stand with hammer in hand. Thank you very much.